Hello. Well, um, since March 2018, when we first launched Woodstock uh, uh, on Horseshoe Lake, the uh, main electronics box has been screwed to the deck just behind the mast. And it's been in a waterproof box, and inside that box, as well as the electronics, there's a small lithium power pack. And uh, the way we turn the power on and off is just to uh, remove the lid of the waterproof box, press uh, a button on the lithium power pack, and then quickly um, put the lid back on. Well, now that we're working towards uh, putting solar panels on the deck, the main electronics has got to go below deck. And therefore, the question arises how we're going to uh, turn the power on and off. We won't be having that lithium power pack. We'll be having some other batteries in the keel. Um, but um, it seemed to me that I would rather not have a mechanical switch poking up through the deck because they tend to, uh, even if you put them in some kind of cut-off plastic bottle top, uh, which is supposedly waterproof, they don't seem to last very long. So uh, since last October, I've been working on the idea of controlling the on-off switch for the power of Woodstock using uh, low-energy Bluetooth. And that is what uh, this video is about. When I started this, uh, I'd obviously used Bluetooth, but I had absolutely no uh, knowledge of the internals of it. And um, when I looked at it, I discovered it was a lot more complicated than I'd expected. Uh, there are lots of different Bluetooth modules that are available off the shelf. And I first looked at this Nordic RF, NRF 52810. Um, they all cost only a few pounds each. Um, uh, and this looked quite nice. And you, uh, the thing that put me off it is that you have to program it yourself in C. Uh, well, I've spent much of my life programming C, and I'm uh, only too happy to do so, but I didn't fancy a kind of learning all this uh, stuff in order to do a simple thing like turning uh, a power switch on or off. So uh, instead, I settled upon this uh, module from Microchip, the RN4871, this one here, that's the smallest one, the simplest one. Um, in the light of my experience, perhaps that was not the best choice. I had various problems with it, which I will uh, uh, disclose in, in due course. Um, but I'm still working on using this kind of uh, thing. Uh, one of its advantages is that you can program it in a relatively simple way using a script that you can load into the uh, microchip. Um, and that's what attracted it um, attracted me to it at the time. The main problem with it is I can hardly see it, let alone uh, do anything useful with it. How I hate these uh, surface mount components, which make prototyping virtually impossible. Still, I'll see if I can solder some wires onto that. Well, I've soldered all the wires on with greater difficulty. Um, I just hope that they're not short-circuiting or anything and that none of them actually come off. I feel I should go and lie down in a dark room now. Well, I finally got it mounted so that I can get it on this breakout board, um, or prototyping board or whatever it's called. Um, there's actually supposed to be a ground plane underneath this, which I have, obviously haven't got. but. They do say that this bit up here, which is the aerial, should be off the edge of your PC board if you mount this properly. So uh, I'm hopeful that this will work for test purposes anyway. Well, that worked for a while, but eventually some of the pads on the bottom of the module broke off. Um, all the manufacturers have... Uh, development kits and microchip has one for this module but I didn't fancy it because it uses another processor as well and uh, which I didn't want to use and it just uh, unnecessarily complicates the situation. I had previously looked on the internet to see if I could find a breakout board for the RN4871 and I failed to do so 
but eventually spurred on by the breakage that I've already uh, had, uh, I found this unit here from uh, a company called Watt Labs uh, in the States, um, which is a very simple breakout board, which just has the RN4871 module taking the pins out so that you can access them and uh, a couple of LEDs and um, a 5 to 3 volt uh, regulator. So I uh, bought one of those and that worked fine. I decided to use the DMP 4015 SK3 uh, P channel uh, MOSFET as a high side switch in the battery. It's capable of switching up to 40 volts, uh, which is a lot higher than any likely battery voltage that we would be using. It's a very small device. It's only six and a half millimeters across, but it's still capable of switching uh, 35 amps. So uh, that is nice. The other good thing about it is that when it is on, its uh, maximum resistance is 15 milliohms. And in fact, I measured it at a plausible current to, to be only 8.1 milliohms uh, on the particular one I've got here. So uh, that means that you're not dissipating any power in the switch when it's on. The simplest circuit that would work for switching the battery is to put this um, P-channel MOSFET in series with the battery in a circuit like this. Uh, this is an N-channel uh, MOSFET down here, a small one. So if the uh, digital signal from the Bluetooth receiver is 0 volts, then this uh, FET is off uh, and this resistor then pulls this FET off. No current is consumed and the battery is off. If however we apply 3 volts from the Bluetooth digital output, turns this FET on which pulls this gate down to 0, which turns the f this uh, FET full on and it then acts like an 8 milliohm uh, resistor. And that's what I wanted to do. But for various tiresome reasons, I ended up with a much more complicated circuit. My requirements for this were that uh, it should be possible by connecting uh, to the boat with uh, a mobile phone or a laptop via Bluetooth uh, to turn the power on or off and to measure the battery voltage. Secondly, if the little battery that powers the Bluetooth receiver itself should fail, that should not change the on-off state of the battery. Thirdly, that if the Bluetooth system should reboot itself, that should not change the on-off state of the battery. And finally, that the Bluetooth battery itself uh, must last at least 18 months. Whilst trying to meet these requirements, I discovered various problems with the RN4871. Obviously, if the RN4871 battery fails, then its digital outputs will be naught. But I discovered that uh, after a power-up or a reboot uh, of the RN4871, it, its digital outputs come up in the one state. That meant that I couldn't trust the naught state or the one state to tell me what I should be doing and it led me to conclude that I have to use not a single digital output but two digital outputs. In this solution I use two digital outputs A and B and have logic in hardware that ignores the naught naught state and the one one state and only take, pays attention to the other two possible states the naught one and the one naught state uh, as being valid commands to change the state of the power switch. That was obviously an additional complication that I would have rather not had to handle. A second problem I discovered is that when the RN4871 is powered up, uh, some of its digital outputs have junk on them contrary to the specification. They're supposed to come up in a state of 1 from the beginning, but that is not the case as I shall now show. The cyan trace here shows one of the digital outputs that I wanted to use uh, after power is applied to the 4RN4871 at this point here. And you can see that instead of coming up cleanly in a, in a one state, it spends about uh, 
50 milliseconds in a naught state. It also has a load of junk at the front here, which if we expand it, looks like that. Now, I raised this with microchip, and they confirmed that this was indeed the case. They could observe it themselves, that it is a, uh, um, not intended. But eventually, after a few weeks, they said, well, it needs a firmware change, and uh, we can't promise that that's going to happen any time soon. So I concluded that I had to uh, work, work around that some way. The final problem that I found was that there are only two uncommitted digital I.O. pins on the RN4871 and I wanted to use one of them to read the battery voltage. That meant I didn't have uh, enough pins to do what I wanted to do. So this caused me to abandon using the RN4871 and to switch to using the RN4870 which is uh, its bigger brother which uh, basically exactly the same thing but it has more I.O. pins available. You can begin to see why I said at the beginning that maybe I shouldn't have started with this particular Bluetooth module. But there is a 75 page user manual as to how you can program this, this device. And I'd actually mastered that. So I was kind of uh, committed to using it. So I uh, soldiered on. Um, the, the next problem that I encountered was that I could not find a breakout board for the RN4870. I had one for the 71, but not for the 70, despite searching far and wide. So, in the end, I had to make one myself. Um, and this is the first uh, PC board that I have made in the last 30 years uh, using um, Easy EDA, uh, which was recommended to me by Ollie Epsom of Drawing Board 82 channel. Uh, or rather, he said that his father recommended it. Um, uh, and uh, I used the firm, uh, Chinese firm JLPCB to, to make uh, PC boards for you uh, for virtually no money. Um, so, having made this board, I then had to solder the unit onto it, which was extremely difficult. So, I made it in the end. That is the RN4871 breakout board, which I abandoned using, so ignore that bit of it. That's my new RN4870 breakout board. Um, this here and here is the electronics that is driven from the Bluetooth board. This is just a serial, uh, a USB to serial connector that's used for programming the thing and wouldn't be there in the final design. And then here we have a 12 volt battery uh, simulating the battery in uh, Woodstock, which may or may not be 12 volts. Um, there is the FET power switch and this bulb which takes 284 milliamps is um, the simulated uh, load. In other words all the electronics and servers etc in Woodstock itself. So here we have my Android phone running uh, the Chrome browser with a JavaScript application in it using the Bluetooth JavaScript API. So it says scan for Woodstock and we press that button. It finds it and if I select, select it and sorry, if I, if I select it and pair with it It will then give us the ability to turn the power on. What? All right, this, this phone doesn't accept my left right hand finger. Though. So it gives us the ability to turn the power on or off. You bastard. See, it only accepts my left finger, not, not the right finger. I mean, how incredible is that? So when the power's on, I can say, Thank you, God. I can read the battery voltage, and for some reason, this is another problem with the RN4870. It always comes up completely wrong the first time, but if I read it again, it now tells me the right answer, which is 12.1 volts. Uh, and if I turn the part off, ooh, it worked that time. Read the battery voltage again, it obviously shows naught. 
so I can do that and I can uh, disconnect so I'm not disconnected the phone but it still stays on and if I disconnect the uh, power from the Bluetooth simulating the battery going down it uh, still stays on if I reconnect the power it still stays on um, and I've tested the other um, combinations so that is basically working and it could be used by Dick or myself or anybody else who's got this uh, JavaScript app on their phone. If you just Google Bluetooth JavaScript API you will find uh, some useful uh, guides about that. The Bluetooth module on my associated electronics takes 130 microamps when it's not doing anything um, and that means that using this uh, 3.6 volt lithium primary battery uh, it should last for at least 18 months um, uh, at sea so that should be okay well it's taken me since last October on and off to achieve this very small step for mankind um, my next task is to put all that electronics onto a proper PCB together with the battery and uh, encapsulate it uh, ready for installation in Woodstock. Um, it's only one of several things that I'm doing uh, uh, in parallel. Thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you next time.